Hi, this is Otto Penzler. I'm here for our weekly show on collecting. I'm in the offices of uh, the Mysterious Bookshop. And today I want to talk about one of my absolute favorite writers, uh, the underappreciated, underknown, not underappreciated by people who have read him, but under acknowledged uh, a man who never made the bestseller list, although he certainly deserved to, uh, the great James Crumley. Crumley is a uh, hard-boiled writer who lived in Montana for a long time. We became good friends. He was, uh, he was one of my, when I started, when I was publishing at the Mysterious Press, uh, I had two authors that I were my targets, the two authors that I most wanted to publish in all the world. One was Ross Thomas, who I did get to publish early, and the other was James Crumley. Uh, the, the reason that I was so eager to publish Crumley is I would read his, uh, what I regard as his greatest book, although there are people who have others that are favorites, um, The Great, The Last Good Kiss, a great title to begin with, and, and, a, and a great book too. Um, it turns out that Crumley was the major influence on several of today's greatest writers. Michael Connolly, Dennis Lehane, George Pelicanos have all said that they could not be writing what they wrote had it not been for what Crumley did before them, which is a tremendous uh, accolade for a writer who, as I said, has never made a bestseller list and may not even be familiar to all of you listening in today. Great hard-boiled writer. Uh, we became friends uh, at various events, voucher cons and th things of that sort. And uh, uh, there are a couple of interesting stories. I'll tell you about the books in a minute, but I, he was such a close friend. I miss him. He died some years ago. Uh, I just want to tell you a couple of things uh, about him. Uh, my wife, Carol, and I went to his wedding in uh, Missoula and... Uh, we didn't know anything about the neighborhood and, and geography, and so uh, we knew that we were supposed to come to the reception at one o'clock in the afternoon. Well, we got there at noon, uh, allowing plenty of time to get lost, which we didn't. And uh, so we were sitting out there, it was a beautiful sunny day, and uh, no one was there, and the reception was gonna be held at the Lumberjack Bar, which is exactly what you'd expect from Crumley. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he didn't dress up. Martha Elizabeth, his lovely wife, got in a beautiful white gown. He was, he was dressed up in his best vest and jeans. Uh, anyway, so we were at the bar early, and I said, well, we're early. We have an hour to kill before people get here. Can I get you a drink? And she said, yeah, just a Bex. So I went inside the Lumberjack bar, and at the, at the bar, there was, the bartender... Could not, she could not have been 20 years old. Um, and she was there, comfortable. Hi, how you doing? So I said, uh, can we have two Becks? And she said, Becks? And she leaned on the, on the bar and said, honey, we got beer. You want some? And she reached down. And there was this barrel with a hose. And she poured the beer in the hose. I didn't realize that Becks was like saying Dom Perignon in uh, Missoula, Montana. Uh, I made the mistake once, uh, uh, and I will get to the books in a minute, I just, I just love this guy so much that I can't help myself. I made the mistake once of, uh, of drinking, well, many times, but the time that was really a mistake was drinking with him. He had come to sign books at my store, and uh, so before the event, uh, his girlfriend at the time, not Martha Elizabeth, but another girl, uh, Carol and I, and, and we invited him into my library for a glass of champagne before the event while he was waiting for the time to, to be appropriate. So we had a bottle of champagne, we did the signing, and then we went to dinner. And we had another bottle of champagne first, and then we had a couple of bottles of wine with dinner. And then he ended the dinner with something brown. It was either a whiskey or a brandy, I don't remember. My mistake was saying, hey, you want to come back to my place for a nightcap? And he said, sure. And we got there just a few blocks away. And uh, I said, what would you like? He said, do you, you have any more champagne? 
And I said, yeah, I do. As it happened, and I couldn't make this up, we had just the day before bought a case of champagne, which was in the refrigerator. So I opened that and the four of us had champagne. It, was, it went really quickly. We had another bottle. And Crumley was one of the great storytellers of all time. And so we were having so much fun. We were talking, we were laughing and drinking champagne. And we had another one. And then we had another one. And finally, Carolyn and his girlfriend, whose name I don't remember, stopped and said they were having water. But we were having such a great time, we were just drinking more. And uh, finally, it was, I learned later, it was about five o'clock in the morning. And I, I said, one more? And he said, yeah. And Carolyn went into the kitchen to get the bottle. And she came back, said, sorry, it's gone. I said, that's impossible. We had a whole case. So she said, all gone. So his girlfriend said, well, it's just as well. We have to catch a flight. So we said good night, hugs and kisses all around. And he went, he was flying to uh, Houston to do a signing at Murder by the Book, a very good bookshop in Houston. I went to work at 11 head pounding the phone rings at noon i picked it up this is verbatim hello mysterious bookshop otto I said yes I said you son of a bitch what did you do to crumley this is martha martha farrington owned the store I said he's supposed to do a signing he can't even stand up <laughs> i hope you feel the way he looks <laughs> if it was any consolation, I said, yes, I do. Um, anyway, about the books. So here's this great writer whose first book was not a mystery. It was a Vietnam War novel called One to Count Cadence. It's a pretty uncommon book to find in this kind of perfect condition. He signed with Random House. It was his first, uh, the first uh, publishing house that he went to. And he stayed with them forever. And uh, as you can see, this is a, a beautiful copy in every way. This is, just to put it in perspective, this is $250, which is actually pretty reasonable for that book. Here's another one. Now, this one's signed, and it has a review slip in. So this is 350 and there's his signature on the title page. But also, as you see, a flawless copy. His second book was his first mystery, The Wrong Case, which was, again, Random House. All of his uh, books for in the early years were all published by Random House. Uh, and it's a signed copy. And this is 350 instead of 250. And I want to show you, Random House has a different system for showing first editions than any other publishing company. I want to show you the, the copyright page. If you'll look, you'll see there's a number sequence and the words first edition. The number sequence starts with two. One of the things that I've pointed out with other authors and that you should remember uh, for later books, most publishers use that number sequence, but it begins at one. For some reason, Random House started it with two. So you get a first edition, and it starts with the number two. Don't think that you have a second printing. You don't. You have the right first edition. I'm going to, just to make it complicated, uh, this is just a, another copy of the wrong case, which looks, it's a first edition, and it looks fine, but at the top, there's a remainder mark. It is fine copy in every other way, but it's $150 because it's not perfect because of the remainder mark. Okay, I'm gonna show you Dancing Bear. Here's a beautiful first edition, $75. 
I'm going to show you the title, the copyright page again. It starts with the number two, and it says first edition. Then, I'm going to show you another copy. It starts with the number two, but it doesn't say first edition. This is a second printing. This is $35. That line is missing, so it's $35. Beautiful copy, but second printing. $75 for <clears throat> the, uh, the true first. And a signed copy, because I have a couple, is $85. And there's the, uh, the signature on the title page. Uh, someone asks, can you explain what a remainder mark is? A remainder mark, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> a remainder mark, when the publisher has too many copies of a book, he's been selling it for a year, for two years, uh, three years perhaps, and the number of copies being sold are is, very, is so small that the publisher's losing money by paying to store it in the warehouse. And so what they do is remainder it, meaning it goes out of print, or at least they eliminate a large portion of their inventory and put a mark, a remainder mark on it. Some people, like Random House, has a, a rubber stamp that shows you that remainder. Most publishers simply have a, uh, a crayon or an ink mark on the top pages or the bottom pages to show that you can't, as a bookseller, you can't return it to get credit for it with the publisher. That's a remaindered copy. And you see those frequently at Barnes & Noble and half price books in Dallas and so on. Um, they're reduced prices. So instead of being $12.95, which that book was, uh, you, would, you could get it for $2.95 or $3.95 because it's a remaindered copy. Now, the great, the last good kiss. And I was going to start with this, but I started, I got off, you know, talking about Crumley. But I have to do this. The, what I regard as perhaps the greatest first sentence in mystery fiction. A lot of people would argue that last night I went to Mandalay again by Daphne du Maurier in Rebecca is the greatest line. And it's the second greatest line. It's a brilliant line. Here's the opening line of The Last Good Kiss. When I finally caught up with Abraham Traherne, he was drinking beer with an alcoholic bulldog named Fireball Roberts in a ramshackle joint just outside of Sonoma, California, drinking the heart right out of a fine spring afternoon. Once you read that, if you cannot go on reading that book, you have no heart, you have no soul, and you possibly have no brain. That's all I'm saying. I don't mean to be judgmental in any way. Uh, so here's a first edition. It's inscribed. Now, for many years, when books were autographed, mystery writers did not go to do signings in bookshops, sit there with a line of people in front of them and sign books. So early books, when they're signed, almost always are inscribed to somebody, usually somebody they know, usually a family member or a close friend or a publishing person, um, and those are signed, inscribed copies. Nowadays, uh, for the last, well, ever since I started it at the Mysterious Bookshop 41 years ago, it is not uncommon for authors, mystery authors, to go to a store and sign books for a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people don't want it inscribed to them. They just want it signed. And the reason they don't want it inscribed to a person, it may not have their name. So they prefer to have it simply signed. So in, in, the, uh, in the book market now, if you're selling an inscribed book, chances are it's less valuable than a plain signed copy. Unless you're a celebrity, unless you're a family member, unless you're his editor or publisher, uh, unless you're Michael Jordan or Tom Brady, uh, chances are it's gonna be less desirable than simply signed. So uh, 
I always wanted my books inscribed to me because they were so personal to me. Uh, I preferred it, but a lot of people nowadays don't. So here's an inscribed copy of The Last Good Kiss, and it's $75. It's a first edition, nice jacket. Here's another copy of The Last Good Kiss. It's a perfect copy. It's not signed, but it's also $75. To show you that the inscription is not a major selling point. I have a couple of simply signed copies that are $100 because that's the most desirable for most collectors nowadays. But look at the condition of this. It's just incredibly, just a perfect copy. I bought, because I'm such a huge Crumley fan, uh, I bought several collections of Crumley over the last several years. So I don't usually have multiple copies of all these books in the store. I'll show you a couple of other things that you may ne that you probably have never seen. I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that. Here's a copy of The Pigeon Shoot. This is a leather bound, full leather. It's limited to 26 copies, lettered and signed by Crumley. It's a perfect copy. What this is, is a screenplay that Crumley wrote that was published uh, by a bookseller, Maurice Neville, in California. It's Neville Books in, in Santa Monica, Santa Barbara, writer, rather, sorry. And uh, I'll show you the limitation leaf, which is somewhere. Is it in the back? Maybe. Otto? Sorry, I, I I should have been better prepared. There we go. So there it is. It's copy R of 26 copies. And it's got its, its own slipcase. It's $450. This is the most expensive Crumley title in the store at the moment. But a beautiful production. There are other limited editions of his books because... Uh, <clears throat> Even though the, the fan base for Crumley is fairly small, it's very intense. Uh, a lot of people feel like me, like the, just one of the greatest writers. Uh, here's a copy of The Mexican Tree Duck, uh, published in, a limited edition published in, in England by Scorpion Press. It was only limited to 75 copies. And it's a perfect copy. It's $125. I got to publish him, by the way, with... The Mexican Tree Duck. And here's a quick story. Uh, I don't want to go too long, uh, but he had published Dancing Bear with Random House in 1983. He, it was a, he had a two-book contract. He was paid $50,000 as an advance for two books. The first book was Dancing Bear, 1983. The way a publishing contract frequently works, and the way it worked here, was that you get half the money on signature. So of his $50,000, he got $25,000 when he signed the contract. When he delivered the Mexican tree duck, the manuscript, he was paid another $12,500 as the second half of the $25,000, which was allotted to each of the two books on that contract. Then there was no book for a year, two years, three years, four years. Then there was a short story collection, another short story collection, no book. And so I'm, I was talking to Crumley and I said, what's going on? You know, you were, you were writing at a reasonable clip. How come there's no book? He said, well, I'm not writing a book for twelve and a half thousand dollars And he explained the contract to me. I said, no, no, you already got twelve and a half. So it's 25. He said, I spent that money already. <laughs> so so I, I said, okay, I, I see your logic, but let me, let's see what we can do. I want to publish you. Uh, so I called his editor, who happened to be the executive vice president, editor-in-chief, a wonderful, brilliant, brilliant editor named Joni Evans, um, who is still active in the world of, of publishing. And I said... Joni, I want to publish Crumley. And she said, you can't have him. He's under contract to me. I said, 
that contract is more than 10 years, is 10 years old. You're never going to get a book. And she said, well, I'm not letting him go, you know, and we went back and forth through his agent mostly. Um, and finally she recognized that she was never going to get a book. So I had to make good the 25,000 that he was paid for his next book. And I had to pay, and this is the only time that I've ever heard of this in publishing, I had to pay for lost profits. And then paid more money to Crumley to induce him to actually write this book. Now, so I'm not speaking ill of the dead. He would be the first person to be talking about this v v openly and proudly. Crumley was a heavy, heavy drinker and he was a drug abuser. So his ability to turn in books or short stories or work on screenplays was erratic. He was sometimes slow to deliver because he was busy, he was too busy drinking. His priority was hanging out at the bar with friends and drinking. So when I made my deal with him, I said, okay, Jim, I don't want you to take any offense, but here's the deal. I will pay you $5,000 every time you deliver 40 pages. I'm not giving you the big advance. I'm not giving you a bunch of money up front. You have to pay, you have to deliver 40 pages and I will send you a check for $5,000 every time you do. He said, okay, I understand, I get that. So that's what we did. It was an uncommon time when I did not get a phone call saying, I'm almost done with 40 pages. Could you send the 5,000 now? And I said, no, no, you got to deliver. And the book was The Mexican Tree Duck. Now, unfortunately, this happened. I got this manuscript, started editing it just as I sold the Mysterious Press to Warner Books. So I only got to edit the first half of the book. And if you read the book, you'll be able to tell when I stopped editing and a junior editor, somebody had hired to work for me, finished editing, who was so intimidated by Crumley that he wouldn't, he was, let's say he was nervous about making suggestions about rewriting. And the book got a little bit wilder there were tanks involved, there was heavy artillery, which only happened after I stopped editing the book. It's a terrific book anyway, because it always is with Crumley. By the way, just one more word about Last Good Kiss. I am so backed up, I never have time to read for fun. It's, it's a rare thing for me. For the last quarter century, uh, I've had not nearly enough time to read for fun, so I never reread a book except for The Last Good Kiss. I've read it three times because I, want, I have to sh share some of the lines. The poetry of this book is so extraordinary that if anybody is in the room or near me when I'm reading it, I say, hey, come here, come here, listen to this, and I'll read lines aloud from the book. It's, it's, it's like reading, it's like rereading your favorite poem. So that's, that's crumbling. There were other limited editions. This is one from Macmillan. It's Border Snakes. Hard to read the title there, but it is. And that's the slipcase for it. And that's what the real, that's what the first edition looks like. Well, I should say the first trade edition, the limited edition preceded it. And this is what, this is what the advanced proof copy looked like. We sent out, uh, Mysterious Press sent out these pages, these these manuscript pages, to uh, to reviewers and to get quotes and so on. And that was signed at ABA ninety six. Yeah. Cool. Yes, signed at the ABA when when Crumley was brought in to uh, to promote this this book in eighty six. But yeah, it is signed. It's a little hard to see on the on the cover. So there we are. That's James Crumley. Thanks for tuning in.